Back in the day in Alaska, it was very common for indigenous people and explorers to travel on sleds pulled by dogs, with the person driving being known as a musher. Dog sledding is dated to go back as early as 1000 AD, but the event that inspired the Iditarod race wasn't until 1925. Back in 1925, Alaska was dealing with a diphtheria epidemic. Diphtheria is a serious infection of the nose and throat that makes it very difficult to breathe. So when this disease started to spread to the remote outreaches of a town called Nome, Alaska, the serum to cure the infection needed to be sent all the way to Nome from Ninana, Alaska, this being nearly 700 miles. Dog sled use had actually been declining in the 1920s and replaced with airplanes and snowmobiles to cross difficult terrain. However, when no capable pilot was available to fly the serum through a blizzard, a team of mushers rushed the serum to Nome through the storm. This historical event became known as the 1925 Serum Run to Nome, or the Great Race of Mercy. Around 50 years later, Joe Reddington Sr. and Dorothy Page decided to organize a race to honor the Alaskan tradition of dog sledding and commemorate the 1925 diphtheria serum run. This race is what we know today as the Iditarod, and it is named after the Iditarod Trail, which was historically used by Native Alaskans. There are actually two different Iditarod courses that alternate every year for the modern day race. Both terrains, however, are tough, and they pass through hilly terrains, swamps, frozen rivers, and thick forests, and the weather conditions can be brutal. Temperatures can range from 50 degrees Fahrenheit above zero to 60 degrees Fahrenheit below zero. That's about negative 51 to 10 degrees Celsius. All of these challenges, in addition to occasional chilling winds and blinding snow, make it a very, very challenging race. There are roughly 27 checkpoints along the route where mushers can stop and rest. Some are in tiny towns and villages, while others are just a simple tent or cabin. Since the 1990s, there has always been a ceremonial start to the race in Anchorage, Alaska, followed by the official start of the race the next day. The total length of the race is over 1,000 miles, or 1,609 kilometers. Anyone wanting to compete in the Iditarod must be 18 years old, have competed in specific qualifying races, and pay a hefty entrance fee of $3,000. The dogs in the race are usually a mixed breed called Alaskan Husky, not to be confused with the purebred Siberian Husky or Alaskan Malamute. Alaskan Huskies are bred specifically for their speed and endurance, and the most intelligent and fastest dogs are picked to lead the rest of the dogs by running in front of the pack. Behind them in the lineup are swing dogs, and those dogs direct the team around turns and curves. And at the back of the dog team are known as the wheel dogs. Wheel dogs run right in front of the sled and are usually the largest and strongest of the team. The rest of the dogs are just known as team dogs for a maximum of 16 dogs per team. Each team must have 12 to 16 dogs at the race's start and at the end of the race at least six of those dogs must be part of the team that crosses the finish line. These dogs have been trained to run long distances and they may cover up to 3,000 miles in their course training preparing for the race. Sled dogs also need to eat around 10,000 calories a day which is roughly 2,000 pounds of food to feed the entire team during the Iditarod. They will also wear little fabric booties to protect their feet from the harsh elements during the race. The mushers, or the people driving the sled, must have very strong mental stamina. They have to carry their supplies with them on the trail, such as a sleeping bag, an axe, snowshoes, a cooking pot, ski poles, a gun, a headlamp, and food. They sleep very little as they push themselves to stay awake to make quicker times, but there is one 24-hour and two 8-hour mandatory rests. The sleds they use cost around $1,500 and are typically 100 pounds before adding the supplies. There's also a basket on the sled to hold gear or place a tired dog so that they can rest. Wild animals on the route like moose, wolves, caribou, buffalo, and other animals can also threaten teams. Race teams even fall through ice like Susan Butcher in 1984, But, amazingly, her two lead dogs managed to pull the entire team out. So these dogs obviously work incredibly hard during this race, and to ensure their well-being, around 37 veterinarians tend to them during the race. Each dog has to pass pre-race exams before they can compete. 
Unfortunately, overexertion leads to death for some of the race dogs and lots of medical problems like foot injuries, dehydration, viruses, ulcers, hyperthermia, and heart problems. Teams of dogs can suddenly get into dog fights and be strangled if they get tangled up in the harnesses. Dogs can also sometimes break free from the harness and get lost. This is why there are mandatory rests for the competitors, but where and when they choose to take that break is up to the competitor. The race takes place over 8 to 15 days with the fastest record for finishing being 8 days, 3 hours, 40 minutes, and 13 seconds. As you may have guessed, the race has grown in popularity over the years and also criticism from animal rights activist groups. Although the Iditarod has a rule stating there will be no cruel or inhumane treatment of dogs, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, also known as PETA, has been vocal in its assertion that the race dogs are pushed too hard. The Humane Society of the United States is also opposed to the contest. It is estimated that more than 120 dogs have died during the Iditarod since its inception. This is not including the number of dogs that have been bred specifically for the race and end up going unused or disposed of. Those critical of the race often call it the I heard a dog instead of I did a rod. Although originally meant to maintain a tradition and art form, the race has become more competitive over the years, which leads to harsher conditions for both mushers and dogs. The question I will leave you with is, when do we place limits on maintaining certain traditions? Thanks for listening.